You know, I walked yeah, into yeah. this, uh, my life was on fire. Uh, shame like I had never experienced before. Kind of shame, you, you forget how to breathe. So I read the gospel with this man, Jude. I, I keep hearing let go. Mm -hmm. And to a person who's been gripping so tight for so long, it feels like the right move to let go, like complete surrender for real. And it stops being this like prep of a movie. I know now like my God was using my ego to draw me to mm -hmm. him, was drawing me away from worldly desires. It was all happening simultaneously. A lot of celebrities are converting, but is it all for show or is it for real? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Hey everybody, welcome to LED Live. We've got a, another show for you and we've got an awesome special guest, Mr. Samuel Tucker. Welcome to the show, Samuel. Hello, nice to see everybody. Well, I'm excited Hello, to nice hear to what you are gonna present today because uh, this is kind of something that I think hits home with every Christian. We're starting to see people giving their hearts what it appears that they're giving their hearts to God. That's what we're laboring for, but mm -hmm. is it real? Is it not? So I, I really am curious, but tell us a little bit about yourself, Samuel. What What is it, is it that you do? No, yes, yeah, so uh, my wife and I, uh, we have a uh, ministry called uh, Glad Tidings 3 AM. Um, just as a, a quick little interject, uh, we actually have a YouTube ministry as well uh, called Glad Tidings uh, 3 AM that you can look up on YouTube and so, uh, we do YouTube ministry as well. We have a uh, uh, different on s different social media outlets. Uh, we travel and speak and things uh, things of that nature. Uh, that's actually where our brother Scott and I met uh, at a local uh, uh, Christian convention uh, out in Oregon, and so uh, that was a real blessing. And so uh, that's uh, what my wife and I uh, do. Awesome. All right. So uh, let's dive into this. What do you got for us today? Yeah, so uh, it's it's a very good point, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, this whole subject of conversion, because at the end of the day, we're Christians, you know, so our desire as Christians is to see other persons converted. Um, but especially when it comes to conversion, you know, there's true conversion and there's also false conversion. And it's really important to understand that uh, not just for those of us who are believers, but especially as we're seeking to minister to people in the world, uh, it's really important to understand that distinction. And especially when it comes to a lot of the uh, conversions, you know, quote unquote, you know, that we see in, in the, the celebrity world and things like that. And again, you know, even the purpose of this is not to unnecessarily label people in a bad light or to say that what they're, you know, elements of what they're experiencing is not genuine. Uh, but as Christians, you know, we really want to be very watchful and vigilant uh, when it comes to when it comes to different things. And so uh, when as it pertains to this particular subject, I was uh, on the Internet and, you know, just as you know, with everything, you know, like, you know, you're on the computer and, you know, you see popped up, you know, in your news feed, you know, different uh, subjects and articles that come up. And so the article that I saw was in regards to Shia LaBeouf uh, being converted. Now, we're all familiar with, you know, Shia LaBeouf. I remember I used to watch him on a television program called Even Stevens. I don't know if anybody here is uh, familiar with that uh, television program, but um, that was a part of my childhood, you know, and so I kind of followed his uh, career, you know, as it were, you know, he was a part of the uh, Transformers uh, franchise, you know, um, he got a lot of notoriety, you know, as a result of that. And so, you know, certainly from a worldly standpoint, he was very successful. Uh, but I don't know how many of us are familiar, but unfortunately, he he's had a lot of uh, personal setbacks uh, in his life. And as a result of that, it's really led him to be, even as it were, kind of blacklisted, even in um, Hollywood, you know, because of some of his bad behavior. But recently, the article, going back to the article that I saw, it was talking about how Shia LaBeouf had converted uh, to Roman Catholicism as a result of him playing in a particular uh, upcoming film uh, that is going to be uh, depicting uh, the role of a Catholic priest. And so uh, it really piqued my interest. And so uh, as a result of that, I started to do some digging. And as I uh, started to look into it more, uh, there were a lot of very interesting things uh, that I found out. So can I ask a question? What was oh, he ahead, yes. converting from? 
Yeah, so that's a very good question. So um, he was mentioning in an interview that I was watching with him, uh, there is a pretty prominent uh, Catholic bishop in America called uh, Father, I believe his name is Robert Barron. And uh, he had a sit-down conversation with um, uh, the Bishop Barron, and he was mentioning that he was of the Christopher Hitchin Samuel Harris persuasion. I don't know if any of our listeners uh, may be familiar with any of those men, but uh, Samuel Harris and uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, unfortunately, Christopher Hitchens has passed away, but uh, those two men were very prominent uh, atheist intellectuals. Um, and there were a lot of arguments that they uh, would bring forth in order to combat religion and Christianity and things like that. And because they were so intellectual, you know, a lot of people in society have tended to espouse uh, their belief system. And so Shia LaBeouf was kind of coming out of that type of vein. And and again, you know, being an actor, you know, very, you know, artsy in his in his thinking and, and things like that. So uh, that was really the background that he was coming out of. And I don't know if you all have seen this as well, um, but especially in a lot of movies, you know, Catholic imagery is very prominent. Um, I don't know if you remember, um, there was a, a movie that came out, I think it was either early earlier this year or late last year, but it was um, the second uh, Venom movie. I don't know if you all uh, saw any ads for that. So um, some of the fight scenes, especially the end fight scene that took place in that uh, movie, uh, took place specifically in a Catholic church. And in regards to a lot of the uh, investigation that I've done in regards to these things, generally speaking, the only uh, Christian churches, uh, as it were, that are used generally in movies is predominantly Catholicism. Uh, yeah, for the yeah. for the most part, it's generally Catholicism that's used in movies. And even, you know, just some film history, um, you know, even uh, Alfred Hitchcock, you know, Alfred Hitchcock is considered, you know, still by, uh, I believe, uh, IMDb as the uh, most influential and uh, the greatest, you know, director of all time. And, you know, according to his, you know, autobiography, you know, Alfred Hitchcock uh, was raised a Roman Catholic. And so in a lot of Alfred Hitchcock's movies, there's a lot of uh, Catholic morale and imagery that are uh, interspersed throughout his um, movie catalog. So um, for our viewers here, we uh, currently have on our screen, so uh, just a little interject. So uh, this is actually a picture of Shia LaBeouf in the upcoming movie that he's uh, playing. And so the particular character that he's playing, it's actually, I believe it was an Italian priest named uh, Padre Pio. And uh, Padre Pio is not, you know, just an ordinary uh, Catholic priest, but uh, Padre Pio is actually a saint as well. So for uh, those of uh, our listeners who do not uh, know about uh, that whole process, is that um, when a Catholic, a person, uh, whether they may be a laity or a part of the clergy, if they manifest uh, miracles um, according to uh, their understanding and things like that, then a person is essentially... Uh, it gives them the opportunity to become a saint in the Catholic Church. And so uh, Padre Pio, he's a saint. And uh, as a result of that, they wanted to do something to depict his life. And so uh, Shia LaBeouf uh, was the uh, actor that was uh, picked for this. Now, there's a very interesting article that I saw from uh, the Rolling Stone. And I'll notice this. This says, Shia LaBeouf says he converted to Catholicism after portraying Mystic Friar in upcoming film. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, I'm not going to read all the details of every article, but just try. I'm just going to try to get out the, uh, the main points. So it says, Shia LaBeouf was so inspired by the subject of his latest film project that it spurred the actor to convert to Catholicism. It says the scandal written 36 year old who raised who was raised Jewish is set to portray Catholic Saint Padre Pio, a 20th century Franciscan Capuchin friar and mystic. Now, for those uh, of our listeners that don't uh, understand what a mystic is, this has to do with mysticism. Now, this has to do with spiritualism and all of these things. Uh, that the Bible talks about that we should uh, stand clear from. But um, as you'll find uh, uh, many of the times, the, the case is that a lot of uh, Catholic uh, priests and, and persons associated with that class, 
a lot of them have been mystics. A lot of them have been mystics. And so it goes on to say, he says, alleged to have the ability to communicate with angels and could heal the sick. It says that LaBeouf spoke to his of his newfound spiritual beliefs in an interview with Bishop Robert Barron. So that's who we were talking about before, uh, Bishop Robert Barron. It says, who himself has drawn scrutiny from both conservative and liberal Catholics for his controversial opinions. And it talks about the different scandals that unfortunately uh, the bishop was a part of. Now, going on in the article, it says, noting that his actions, which span accusations of sexual assault and abuse against at least three women to arrest for battery and disorderly conduct, led to serious infliction of pain and damage on other people. So this is what uh, Shia is talking about his experience. It says LaBeouf stated he was thrown into a deep depression in recent years. And, you know, even as we come on and we talk about these different things, this is by no means to make light of or to or to to denigrate um, the genuineness of what Shia is is going through. Because, as we know, just with the human experience in general, that God uses a trial and conflict in order to draw us closer to him so that, you know, so this is by no means to, to negate those things that Shia is going through. Um, and so it goes on to say, thrown into a deep depression in recent years, particularly after his ex-girlfriend, FKA Twigs, filed a lawsuit against him for relentless abuse. And, you know, sometimes I really think about this, especially, you know, because, you know, they're, you know, for Little Light Studios, you know, making a lot of, uh, you know, content in regards to, you know, celebrities and this is that and the other. And I know that this is, uh, something that you all think about as a lot as well is, especially as Christians, you know, when we think about sharing the gospel, you know, we certainly think of reaching, you know, uh, people who are in poverty. You know, we think about, you know, reaching people who, you know, live in the suburbs or even going to a foreign country, you know, to, um, you know, reach people in very destitute situations. And we should do that. But many times I think about like what type of serious active work is being done to reach people in, in the very high echelons of society. Like what type of systematic work is being done by us as Christians to reach people like Shia LaBeouf, you know, to reach people that are, you know, say athletes or, or presidents or whatever the case may be. Because a lot of times with these people, they live in such a, a bubble. And I know that some of us, you know, can attest to this. I know that, uh, you know, you, Brother Scott, can, you know, really you know, identify with this is that, you know, when you're in those circles, it's not as easy to come in contact with the gospel of Christ. And unless, you know, there are people to really go out of their way to cease to reach those classes, a lot of times, you know, these dear beloved people, you know, can, you know, even go to Christless graves, you know, so that's a thought that I, I think about a lot. I remember when um, the actor from Two and a Half Men kind of mm -hmm. was you know, coming out yeah. and, and being converted. Yeah. I, I actually had a, a conversation with him and he said the exact same thing. He said, you know, I really feel like God woke me up and, and I started having Bible studies and he really felt like his heart being tugged to go out and reach the celebrities. Now, if, if, if he's done that, I don't know. I, I only had one conversation with him, so it's hard to say what, oh, yeah. what, what he actually like has gone on and transpired and done. But um, yeah, I mean, he said, that it is very difficult because a lot of times those circles are surrounded around people who really don't care about religion and you know it's it's not easy to penetrate through some of those circles and mm. get to them i think that's a fair point it's a point that can be made from our vantage point our perspective people who aren't in those high levels of hollywood but i don't think that means that there aren't people there there's oh, yeah. so many examples in the bible you have the daniels who are in high places all the way to those who weren't in high places who are doing work like the apostles and, and those people and for us who aren't there i don't think it would be wise unless you are truly called by the holy spirit to try to go there <laughs> go there just for the purpose of of reaching people but our position to play is definitely prayer no, exactly. You know, because, you know, just like you, know, uh, you were mentioning, sis, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, sometimes, you know, you can have the thought, well, um, I can just go into whatever circle, you know, God will protect me, you know, but we have to be careful. You know, you know, the whole purpose of, you know, even, you know, LED, you know, light exposing darkness is to, you know, really show that unless we really do have the power of God, you know, the darkness will, will overtake us. No, but those are very good points. 
Um, so the article, it goes on to say, I started hearing experiences of other depraved who had found their way in this, and it made me feel like I had permission. The actor said of the Catholic faith, I know that God was using my ego to draw me to him, drawing me away from worldly desires. Now, that's that's powerful that he was even able to come to that conclusion that God was seeking to draw him away from worldly desires. And that's very true, you know, because especially when we think about celebrity conversions, especially. And this is something that um, for those uh, of our viewers that are watching to, to really pay attention to, because the Bible says that we shall know them by their fruits. And certainly, you know, our purpose in doing this is not to uh, judge anyone in a negative way. But if we're say that we're following Christ, that means that there should be a transformation, a supernatural transformation that is taking place in the life that reveals that God has done something special within our hearts. And especially, unfortunately, you know, I've seen different cases and I know that we've all seen the examples of and God bless their hearts, you know, the celebrities, you know, and say, you know, it's they're at the Oscars or whatever may have you. And, you know, they just, you know, start in an R rated movie where there was all of this sexually explicit content and all the cursing and swearing and violence and then you know they'll get up on the oscar uh podium and the first thing that they'll say is that you know i thank god you know for giving me the ability to do this and again you know it's not to uh to you know harmfully judge anyone or whatever may have you but the bible makes it very clear as to what god condones and what he doesn't condone and just because we say that that God is helping us doesn't really mean that he's helping us. Uh, what it may actually mean is that there is another God who is giving them that ability. Hmm. Yeah. See, that's why I asked earlier which Christianity, because um, let's just assume that the actors who play in these films and then go on stage and thank God, let's assume that they're being genuine, right? right. <laughs> and so looking at Shia LaBeouf's um, statement here it is common for people to find uh relatability I, well, god can accept me for who i am and i don't have to prove anything he'll just say to me which is true which is beautiful uh but the issue is when you stay that way or you think that yeah. um there's no need for change there's no need for perfection even though god says be perfect even as i am perfect yeah. and i think that's where people get into yeah this idea where, yeah, I can play these roles, I can live this lifestyle and still say, thank you, Lord, for saving me without any real change. Mm -hmm. I know the one word that stuck out in that sentence was ego to me. I thought, I know God was using my ego to draw me to Him. I mean, if, if He's drawing Him to Him to a Catholic faith, I think that's really interesting because mm -hmm. what, I guess the Bible would say it this way, which God is drawing him to you. I don't know. That's that's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's a very good point, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, some of our uh, viewers are Roman Catholic, and uh, there may be some of us who are Roman Catholic who have maybe uh, never heard some of these things before. And so uh, as we get deeper, I, by God's grace, some things should be, uh, should be made clear. I do want to make one more point. Um, no, I, I, I do want to make it clear that transformation doesn't have a timeline. So just because someone doesn't change like within a year of conversion, you know, that doesn't mean that we should pass any type of judgment. But I think the reason why a lot of people come into the faith and then leave is because they were looking for a change. Like they were looking for happiness or what have you, and they didn't find that. And that's because a transformation wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. So there is there is a sacrifice that comes with that transformation that is also coupled with reward like it's an exchange where god takes away the bad that is within us and fills it with um the the love and the happiness that we're looking for so if someone comes into faith and they're not given that message of transformation it's it makes sense why they would leave because they're not finding anything different from the world right you know? yeah the gospel has power <clears throat> that's that's really what 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 paul alludes to and, well, he doesn't just allude to it, he flat out pretty much says it. Um, what's, what's going on, at least what I see going on, is you have a, a lot of what you're describing, and that is a form of godliness, but denying its power. Mm -hmm. and, and the way Paul, that's what it says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 5, but the way Paul describes it in Romans, the first chapter, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Without that power of God, 
we have nothing. There, there will be no change in somebody's life. And without change, what's the point? Mm -hmm. There's exactly. no difference. You're not offering them anything. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we need, we, we, that's, that's what we need. I mean, if, if, you're not, if you're not going to Christ for power, I don't know why you're going, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, it might make you feel better that you've come to him, but at the end of the day, if you don't see victory and change, you're, that's probably going to lead to depression. Yeah. I, I want to throw this out there. As we were talking, a thought came to my mind, because the question is, what are they coming for? Maybe what they get, not, not really talking about like um, the God aspect, is community like they get a family so to speak and do you think maybe that's why there's an issue with let's say the, let's use the catholic church and as, as an example because that's what we're talking about an issue with um covering things up covering sins up abuses mm. on these things because they're trying to hold on or keep intact the one thing that may be um helping them a little bit is that community aspect what do you think yeah and i think people i think people can come for love you know We've had people on this show and, and, and they'll tell us that, you know, it was love that, that drew them in. But again, in that love, you know, Christ, you know, the Bible says, you know, in John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, why did he give him, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can have eternal life? Well, there are conditions to that. And, you know, the simple fact that Jesus was put or willingly laid his life down on a cross and shed his blood was because of sin and because we can't overcome sin. And so, you know, I think there may be things that you're saying like initially draw you in. And I, I guess I'm going to the far down the road saying ultimately, if there's no change, there's no point in coming. Yeah, it's not enough. Because you're not, you're not going to stick around if it doesn't transform you. And why would you? You know, it makes sense. <clears throat> I think too in Shia's like um, experience. I remember seeing an article with him talking about having this God-sized hole in his heart. I think he's recognizing like like the human condition of like this is not fulfilling. I need something grander, and there's only mm -hmm. this this thing God can fill this. And he sees that and he says, God's drawing me away from from worldliness. But I think the devil just steps in during that process and he's just like, oh, oh yeah, now you want God? Well, I'll give you something that's kind of like, <laughs> and, and so it gets kind of confusing if it's going to be sort of this step in the right direction, but no transformation. Yeah, and it's so hard to tell in, in a lot of these cases because they make some initial steps and, and like, um, like he was talking about, um, you want to see fruit, but fruit doesn't happen overnight you know you plant a true? seed it grows you know fruit fruit happens in time and again i go back to people that we've had on our show they've had those seeds planted and the fruit didn't come for a while but they were still coming so it's kind of it's kind of hard in some cases like with kanye it was like is he or isn't he mm. you know mm -hmm. but it but at some point you think i'm renouncing the things that I've said or done that are contrary to Christianity. Mm -hmm. You want to see that come out of that experience. Mm -hmm. Why does God allow that? He sees a soul genuinely looking, trying to fill that God-shaped sized hole. And maybe there's a little bud on the vine and Satan just comes and snatches it off. Like, why doesn't God step in as the bodyguard and say, oh, don't touch that? Because that illustration that Jesus told about casting the seed mm -hmm. on soil fertile, you know, it's like those seeds of truth are cast in many different settings and situations. And, uh, you know, I think some of these people, they, they, you know, they, for whatever reason, they, they respond to it immediately, but maybe they don't sink and pick up the Bible and actually mm. read the Bible. Because if, if you read the Bible, there's a lot of things in there that say you shouldn't be involved in sexual immorality. You shouldn't be involved in these things. So why would I be in a movie that's promoting that? You know, he's like, there's, there's kind of a whole line of logic there that I think you would get out of that. And it's, it's a high cost. You follow God, it's a high cost. Yeah, that's good. Jeremy, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek with me, seek 
with all your heart. With all your heart, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's got to be. There's there's rules of engagement that the that Satan and God have established, and those rules of engagement are for the court in heaven and, and say, hey, I, I can step in because of this and I can't touch this because of that. And we don't know. We see through a glass darkly right now. But we do know that if we seek with all our heart, we will find the truth. God will lead us to the truth. Mm -hmm. It's got to be tough because like in that parable you were alluding to, you know, seed can easily get choked out and they haven't left necessarily people that are in this position. They haven't necessarily left all the worldly cares. They're still there. And they still have access to all the things they have had access to. And if there's, you know, especially if there's addictions involved, those, those don't break easy. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Goal. We've, we've taken up a lot of your time. What, yeah. what else? Sorry. <laughs> where, where were we? No, no. It's um, the discussion is a blessing. You know, these things are the dialogue really helps to give more definite shape, you know, to what we're talking about. Yeah. But the article goes on. There's there's a few interesting points at the end of this article. You know, it's really interesting because, you know, we all know Rolling Stone is not a religious outlet, but it's very interesting. Their take on Shia's experience in converting to Catholicism and it's very interesting. It says uh, the actor was raised primarily by his artist mother, this is the first paragraph, and has spent the last decade of his career constructing a variety, notice, of esoteric and ceremonial performance art pieces, many of which deal with the extremely Catholic virtues of humility, guilt, and penance. So in principle, even before Shia took on this role, some of the things that he was already practicing were very already Catholic, if that makes sense. And so it says, but while Catholicism teaches that believers can find redemption for their misdeeds by saying a handful of Hail Marys and attending confession, it's unlikely LaBeouf's reputation and history of denying the physical abuse he caused will be solved. So that talks about the whole PR. Now, the last paragraph it says, news of LaBeouf's conversion comes days after the actress, uh, director, uh, Olivia Wilde, revealed that the actor's combative energy ultimately prompted her to fire LaBeouf from the lead world of her upcoming psychological thriller. It talks about all that. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to jump to uh, this particular individual here, because this is just to give an understanding some of, of what Shia is is going through and dealing with now in some of the uh opening remarks we were talking about some of the history of cinematography and you know i'm not very you know old in years but i've i have really come to understand and this is a biblical principle the bible brings out the grave necessity of understanding and knowing history it's very interesting you know especially when you look in the old testament Part of the reason why the children of Israel kept rebelling against God was because they did not remember nor have a knowledge of their history retained in their mind. Now, as I started to study the history of cinematography, I came across some things that were very startling. Now, the particular individual that we have on the screen is a gentleman by the name of Tupper Saucy. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. Uh, he wrote a book called Rulers of Evil. Rulers of Evil. Now, this is very interesting. This is taken from the book. This says, Embedded in the Ratio Sidorium were the elements of entertainment, of dramatic production, composition, rhetoric, and eloquence. These courses interlink with the spiritual exercises to intensify the exper experientially of Catholic doctrine over scripture and Protestantism. They resulted in a genre of spectacular plays that won distinction as Jesuit theater. Now, we're going to read a, a, another a statement uh, in this book, but what that particular paragraph was talking about was that during the time of the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church was dominating all of Europe. Essentially, all of the Catholic states of Europe were, dominate, were dominated by the Roman Catholic system. Now, in order to counteract the Protestant Reformation at that time, 
there, there were different means that were constructed in order to combat that. That was called the Counter-Reformation. I don't know if any of our listeners um, even know what uh, uh, those, those, uh, those statements are, uh, but that's, that's a part of history. Now, this second paragraph is really interesting. It says, The faculty of Munich College praised the way Jesuit theater captivated Protestants especially the parents of school-aged youngsters. Now, this is very interesting. This is a direct quotation. There is Now, this was uh, quoted from a Catholic priest. There is no better means of making friends out of the heretics. Now, again, some of our listeners may not know what a heretic is, but uh, during the Middle Ages, when the Catholic Church ruled Europe, if you did not agree with the Catholic Church on any point, whether it was theology or science or whatever the case may be, if you did not agree with what they uh, taught, you were considered a heretic. To give an example, there was a man by the name of Galileo Galilei. I'm pretty sure some of us are familiar with him. He's a, he was a genius. And Galileo Galilei, um, based upon his studies and all these things, he came to the conclusion that the world was spherical. But the Catholic Church at that time taught that the world was flat. And so as a result of that, Galileo was, was deemed a heretic and he was put on house arrest. And so this goes on to say, And the enemies of the church and filling up the enrollment of the school, then good high-spirited play acting. So this Catholic priest was saying that the greatest way to make heretics stop being heretics and to become Catholic is by giving them theater and play acting. It says, uh, Molière's Jesuit theatricals in Paris were so popular that even the dress rehearsals were sold out. And so at the very bottom, it says, even from the West Indies, a Jesuit missionary reported that nothing has made a forceful, a more forceful impression on the minds of, of the Indians than our play. Now, this is very interesting. Now, I don't know if any of us know who uh, this gentleman was. Uh, this was a Catholic priest during the uh, uh, 17th century, a man by the name of Alphonsus de Liguri. Now, the reason why we're bringing up uh, this particular individual is that when you go and watch Shia LaBeouf's interview with um, uh, Bishop Barron, Shia, he talks about that one of the things that greatly helped to lead to his conversion was the Latin Mass. The Latin Mass. Now, again, for those of us who are not familiar with this, uh, the Latin Mass, that's essentially the uh, communion service that's done by the Catholic Church, and it's done in Latin. It's not done in, in another language, but it's particularly done in the Latin language. And Shia was saying that the Latin Mass was one of the greatest things that contributed to his conversion to Roman Catholicism. Now, this Catholic priest, Father Liguri, he's going to tell us what happens during the Catholic Mass. When I read this, this is literally mind-blowing. And again, I know that what we're about to read, uh, probably the majority of our listeners have probably never heard this before. But this is amazing. Notice. Now, this is his own words in, in his book. We find that in obedience to the words of his priest, hoc es corpus meum, so these are the words that the Catholic priest says during the Mass, God himself descends on the altar. So just to give a background, so according to Catholic theology, during the Mass, when the priest has that wafer, they literally believe that that wafer turns into the literal body of Jesus. It says that he comes wherever they call him and as often as they call him and places himself in their hands, even though they should be his enemies. And after having come, he remains entirely at their disposal. They move him as they please from one place to another. They may, if they wish, shut him up in the tabernacle or expose him on the altar so Liguri, he's essentially talking about that the priest is so powerful that he can literally move God as embodied in this wafer wherever he pleases. And at the bottom it says, 
they may, if they choose, eat his flesh or give him as food of others. Oh, how very great is their power. Now, this is the second paragraph. This is this is amazing. It says, oh, how wonderful dignity of the priest. Oh, wonderful. Cries out St. Augustine. In their hands, as in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, that's speaking about Mary, the Son of God becomes incarnate. Hence priests, notice, hence priests are called the parents of Jesus Christ. Now, for those of us who are acquainted with our Bibles, we know that the Bible does not teach this. And again, this is by no means seeking to attack our Catholic brothers and sisters who may be watching this or those who have never heard this before. But this is what the Catholic Church believes and teaches. It says, hence priests... Uh, are called the parents of Jesus Christ. Such is the title that St. Bernard gives them. Now, notice this statement. Thus, the priests may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator. Now, from a uh, biblical standpoint, that is pure blasphemy. Yeah. Pure blasphemy and Shia, he, he said that this Latin mass where all of these blasphemous things take place, according to the Bible, is what led to his conversion to Roman Catholicism. But the amazing thing about it is, is that there's a reason for this. Now, I'm going to quote from a book called The Great Controversy. Now, for those of our listeners who are not familiar, The Great Controversy is one of the, the best uh, expositions uh, that's been done on the books of Daniel and the Revelation, a timeless, uh, timeless volume. It says the religious service of the Romans church is a most impressive ceremonial. Its gorgeous display and solemn rites fascinate the senses of the people. So this is to give some sympathy to what Shai was going through, because as he was seeing the Latin mass, his senses were being overwhelmed by what he was experiencing. It says the silent and silence, the voice of reason and conscience, the eye is charmed, magnificent churches, imposing processions, golden altars, jeweled shrines, choice, choice paintings, and exquisite sculpture appeal to the love of beauty. Now, I personally had the privilege to visit uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York a number of years ago, and anyone who's ever been to a Roman Catholic church will tell you that from a pure aesthetic standpoint, it is very beautiful. I mean, the 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 architecture is, is truly breathtaking, honestly. But as we're going to go on to read, that as a result of it being so overwhelming to the senses, that unfortunately, Satan uses this in order to blind the mind. It says the ear is also captivated. The music is unsurpassed. The rich notes of the deep tone organ blending with the melody of many voices as it swells through the lofty domes and pillared aisles of her grand cathedrals cannot fail to impress the mind with awe and reverence. So as Shai was experiencing these things, the awe and reverence of what was taking place around him was so overwhelming him that in his mind, he believed that this must be the movings of God in his life. Now, isn't that interesting that it's like, you know, the devil's really smart. <clears throat> he knows when to make something like make fun of it or whatever like that. But in a worship situation, if he really wants you to believe something, he's like setting all the right things in position so that like all your senses are like, yes, this is it, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yes, this is it for something that, like, I, I was kind of blown away by that statement. Like, the creator can be... Become the, yeah, the, the creator cre yeah. is the creator's creator. Yeah. Or something like that. Like, right? what? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, it's all about feeling. Satan's, Satan's idea is uh, t to convert the heart is away from God, is to use feelings right. and, and your senses and to make you feel as if something has happened inside you when right. it hasn't. You're overwhelmed, so therefore it must be true. What are we saying here, that coming to Christ should not be an emotional experience? Not at all. I think God made emotions. We, we have emotions for a reason. Like, like, we know that God feels emotions. He's upset at the people and he's like, all right, Moses, I'm going to wipe them out and I'm going to start over with you. 
that's a that's an emotional experience that yes. is an interesting window into God. You know, um, God experiences anger. God experiences love, laughter, joy. You know, like mm -hmm. all these emotions that He gave to us. So I think, like in our involvement with you know getting involved in in a, a relationship with God. I mean, when you first fall in love, was that not an emotional experience? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you have this emotional experience with God, but I think God's saying, you know, come, let us reason together. Like, like I want to show you the reasons why this is the way that it is. Your emotions can lead you astray. Yeah, okay. it's what's leading right. your thinking. Is it your brain or something else? Right. What you've learned or what you have felt. Yeah. Right. Cart before the horse kind of a thing. You know, it's like God created and designed the system like that, so you can't say it's wrong, but it's when it drives us, yeah. it can easily uh, manipulate us. And I think that's what exactly happened to Eve. She walked up, the Bible gives you that little piece of information. The fruit looked good to her to eat. Mm. Like, like the emotion of like, ooh, that looks yummy. It's and crazy the, because this, this whole experience that the, the Catholic Church has set up, you know, all this beauty that they've put and, and all the aesthetics and everything, the sights, the sound. Israel had something similar. Yeah. I agree. But it didn't, it, there were checks and balances in the way that really prevented their emotions from leading their thinking. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's, I think that's where, you know, and, the, and, and yes, there, there were priests, you know, and sanctuary service, and, you it know, the sinners had to come and, and experience the sights and the sounds and the smells and the, and the whole bit. But it was done. It, it was done in a way that God set up, mm -hmm. you know. And and in that, there's there's wisdom and there's safeguards. And if elements are overemphasized, that's where it gets you know imbalanced. And God knew in the sanctuary service, for example, the right mix. You know, it's one thing you don't see them doing in a Catholic service is. That person having to go forward and slit a lamb's throat mm. and collect the blood, you know, that 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 had to be mm. intense. You, I'm sure there was a lot going in the mind and having to think through that process. Yes, there were emotions with mm. that, but you're you're having to grapple with like, wow, I had to take a life. I had to take the best. This cost me. And then, you know, the priest is there to also teach and guide and, and direct their mind to, yeah. And what do you think that costs God, you know? Mm. So there's elements there, but it's just, I think it's imbalanced. It's, it's not the right mix. There's one more thing I want to pick your brain about in terms of the element, because it was not just beauty, it was also the music. I don't know about any of you, but I've never seen a drum set in a Catholic church. Huh. You know, so, so it wasn't, it, I'm sure there wasn't the heavy bass. It was probably more of solemn music, yet the effect was still according to this, or according to the Bible, negative, so to speak. So where, where do we, what do we do with that? Music is designed to open the heart to receive a message. And yeah. so that's why we play a piece of music for a call, altar call or something. You know, it's like, it's, it's really, it's, it is really designed to make this decision that you're making, this, this prompting that you're feeling from the Holy Spirit, you're stepping up, an experience. And music helps kind of heighten that experience, right? Yeah, it doesn't mean that it doesn't, again, it kind of goes back to, it doesn't mean that the elements that they have are all necessarily wrong. wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just the way that they're being used. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, the we talk about recipe. this all the time, you know, it's like people will approach us and they'll be like, is it wrong to do this? And it's like, well, it kind of depends, you know, yeah. like, yeah. What is your motivation? Motives. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, and that's where it's like God knows God knows what's in the heart. And just like he knows what's in the heart of so many Catholics, mm -hmm. right? God knows what's there. But, you know, to the music part, it's like, yeah, it's designed in a way to create a response just like he's saying. But it doesn't mean that the music's bad. But I think like like to kind of dive deep into your thing without taking up too much of your time here, Samuel. Um, the 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 um, the the choir music and everything and it just it's so angelic. So mm -hmm. I, I can imagine that your senses are are being opened, your heart's being opened. Whereas I think a lot of the the, the just heavy rhythmic drum stuff it, it it does the opposite effect. 
mm-hmm. if you could say that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, or it I, opens your heart in a different way. Exactly. I think I think they're kind of one w- w- different in their in their experience. Maybe it just unlocks different emotions. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, know, that's a a very interesting point, uh, you know, to bring up in regards to music, because we're actually going to touch on that just very briefly uh, before this is over, uh, because it's really interesting how that even ties into all of this. This uh, closing statement, it says the religion of a religion of externals is attractive to the unrenewed heart. Now, for those of our listeners who who, uh, don't know what that means, the unrenewed heart, that's just simply talking about a person who's not converted uh, and you can even be unconverted and, and be going to church. You know, just a, a very good example, you know, the Apostle Peter, before he was converted, you know, he unfortunately did a lot of things, you know, and, and it eventually led him to deny Christ. And he not only denied Christ, but he denied Christ by cursing and swearing. And so unfortunately, Peter's heart was unrenewed. And so it goes on to say, the pomp and ceremony of the Catholic worship have a seductive, bewitching power by which many are deceived and they come to look upon the Roman church as the very gate of heaven. Now, moving along very quickly, we talked about Kanye West and some of uh, uh, some of our other statements. Now, Kanye West's experience is very interesting, very interesting as we talk about Shia LaBeouf and Roman Catholicism. Because uh, I remember when this was gaining a lot of prominence, like back in 2019, you know, the Lord, you know, just put it on my mind to go and do some digging in regards to this. And what I found was very interesting. This is a Kanye West Sunday service, a religious experience or celebrity call. We're not going to go through the details, uh, but it essentially talks about that uh, in this worship experience and even in this next article right here. It says that Kanye West Sunday service, he is the church, where even NPR highlights the fact that Kanye West is really the focus of these worship services. That it's not even really God, but it's really Kanye that's at the center of the worship. Now going on, this says Kanye West Sunday service isn't exactly church, but it is Christian. Very interesting. Now... This is talking about his former wife, uh, Kim Kardashian. Now, this says Kim, on the other hand, said in a 2018 interview with Vogue that the whole family identifies as religious. Now, this is interesting because, again, this is not to land blast Kim Kardashian and her family, but it's very evident that that family, sadly, is not walking with the Lord. Um, uh, You know, those sisters, you know, Either all of them or very many of them uh, are very promiscuous sexually and, and they advocate things that are not biblically sound. And so as a result of that, we know that the religion that at least they're practicing is not biblical. It goes on to say we are very Christian and our work ethic and our discipline comes from so many years at Catholic school. So their moral framework was fashioned by them going to Catholic School. Interesting point. Now, this is from another article. This is actually from a Catholic uh, news agency. And this says Kanye West, Jordan Peterson, who some of our listeners may be familiar with, and the allure of Catholicism. And I would really encourage our hearers to go in and and, uh, read this article. But it's amazing. This article, again, without going into the details... It talks about that those who adhere to Kanye West Sunday service, those who adhere to the teachings of Jordan Peterson, if they follow on in that path, that they will eventually become Roman Catholic. Now, I'm just going to end with this particular slide here because, you know, even as we mentioned before, I don't in any way, nor I know that none of us are are trying to do this at all, to try to denigrate the sincerity that that uh, Shia uh, is expressing. And at the end of the day, you know, we don't know his heart. And, you know, we pray that by God's grace that the Lord continue to uh, may continue to grow him in a genuine experience and really bring him to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, but this picture here on the screen is just a symbol of bondage, just a symbol of bondage. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly read a passage from the book of Romans. Uh, just to get a better understanding, this is Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. 
Notice what the Bible says. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And unfortunately, when we yield ourselves to the lust of the flesh, that Galatians 5 talks about, we become servants of sin and servants of Satan. But God wants to free us from this bondage. You know, the Bible says all throughout the book of John, you know, whom the Son sets free, you know, he is free indeed. And bringing out that principle of the liberation that takes place when we receive Christ into our hearts. Uh, but I'm going to read a statement from a very powerful book called The Desire of Ages. Uh, this, is, uh, this book is actually in the Library of Congress as one of the greatest books written uh, on the life of Christ. Now, this really helps to encapsulate the work of conversion. And this is all of our prayer for, uh, for Shia and anyone who really has a desire to come to the Lord. It says, when the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. A change is wrought in which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work bringing a supernatural element into human nature. In the middle, it says, a soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. But unless we do yield ourselves to, uh, to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. At the bottom, it says, if we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. It says the only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God and not just, you know, just a passive acquaintance, not just flipping up, you know, and opening up our Bibles every now and then, but a consistent, loving, intense relationship with our Lord. It says we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. And again, at the bottom, it says, without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. And this is by no means to leave a gloom and doom picture, but the reality is, is that the Bible depicts that we're in a spiritual warfare. And Satan, the enemy of souls, is, is laboring earnestly for our destruction. And if we are going to be free from that satanic influence, we really have to run to Jesus. And I really want to emphasize this for the listeners because especially consuming content, content like Little Light Studios and other ministries that are really seeking to shed light on things, God is giving these privileges to us, not for us to just watch and to say, wow, that's amazing. You know, look at all of the satanic things that are happening in the background. When we watch these videos and, and all of these different programs, these are efforts that God is making to speak directly to our hearts. And it would be certainly a shame to watch all of these amazing programs and to still go back and watch the same thing. So that's just my encouragement for us that as we watch these different things and as we share them, that we will pray that the Lord will really help us to turn away from sin and to really follow Jesus. Amen. 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 Well said. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Samuel, for coming and breaking this down for us. You know, uh, it really, information is just information. No matter who gets it, if it doesn't transform you, it's yeah. not going to save you. Yeah. That's right. And I think that's the that's the bullet point that you have brought out and very clearly in this uh, this message. So, you know, thank you. And all of you guys that are listening out there, um, if you want to check out Samuel's channel, Samuel, say it again. Yes. Yeah, so we are on uh, YouTube and our name is Glad Tidings 3 a.m. Glad Tidings 3 a.m. And when you go and look at it, um, our logo is like a like an earth symbol with a three angels around it. 
Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. So check out Samuel's channel, and if you want to hear him, he's got some great content on there. But thank you for coming by and blessing us, and we hope those of you guys out there that are listening, you got a blessing out of today's uh, topic. And you know, pray for these people. These people are are also, you know, if he's yeah. feeling the pull of coming out of the world and, and, and changing, that means that God is, is tugging on his heart and the devil's probably not going to let him go very easy. So we need to pray for these people that God will penetrate the darkness, surround him with people who can share truth with him and that his heart will receive that truth so that the roots can take uh, hold and really grow and fruit into something beautiful. So Amen. thank you guys Amen. for listening. Thank you all you supporters out there. And uh, don't forget, check out our t-shirts. We believe in wearing your witness. So lightwear.shop. And we got a lot of cool designs. Thumb through that. And we'll see you guys on the next weekend. Welcome to the Video Bible Study Series, where we will explore a variety of Bible topics using video and print. What is humility? Do we need God's law? Can I understand the Holy Spirit? Yes, you can, and we're going to solve that today in five minutes or less. They're designed to engage you by watching a five-minute video, having a discussion on the topic, and diving deeper into it with a lesson study. Each study asks questions, has discussion points, and or has activities. Overall, we developed this project for you to have a closer walk with Jesus as you explore relevant topics, either in a group setting or on your own. We hope you find these a blessing. If you want more information, go to www.littlelightstudios.tv or find us on your favorite social media platform. Hi, you might not know me, because I work mostly behind the scenes. But my name is Michael, and I'm the director of Little Light Studios 3D department. Right now, we're experimenting with new technology, where we're trying to blend reality with the virtual world. It's more efficient and offer us the opportunity to make higher quality productions with better visuals. By using the Unreal Engine software, it gives us the possibility to create realistic virtual environments for sets in a short amount of time. We are working with what we have because we do have financial limits. That's why we're working toward getting an LED wall in the future because it will allow us to use extended reality. This simply means that we don't need green screen anymore. It will save us tremendous time in the post compositing process. We will also have realistic accurate lighting that comes from LED wall which matches the subject and the set in real time. Actors are able to see the set rather than having to imagine the scenes within the confines of the green screen. So that's what we've been up to here at Little Eye Studios. We're so thankful for the ways that God has blessed us. And we're so excited for what he has for us in the future.